Uh, I just wanted to say that I think it's important at a, in, the, in the time in which we live to be very intentional about all of the traditions and all of the customs that we have, no matter what they are. Uh, this this is the original way to interact with all of the um, actions or traditions or customs or ways of being in the world. That was how the Prophet ﷺ brought those things. He emphasized the intention and the importance of understanding that this is a devotional experience between you and your Creator. Um, and then, of course, with time, certain things become entrenched in a, in a culture in a way that makes them, that allows certain people to engage mindlessly. And there are, you know, in some, in some sense, that's good. It's good to be able to just rest on a, on a ritual and, and, and find yourself at home in a practice without having to think about it very much, without having to reinvent it every time. Uh, at the same time, there has to be a, a good <clears throat> dynamic between rethinking and re, uh, evaluating what is my, what is my personal investment in this? What am I really doing when I celebrate this? What am I really doing when we have Eid? Even the regular Eid, just Eid al-Fitr, yani, the end of Ramadan. Is it just about, you know, as, as people have said, is it just about the nice clothes? Is it just about the food that you cook? Those things are beautiful. Those things are wonderful that we have those things, but there has to be that dynamic between what's, what am I really doing? And yes, I'm happy that I have these traditions. And how wonderful that we have whatever we do in the road, that we have the songs that we sing. But again, what are we really doing when we sing those songs? What are we really trying to achieve? There has to be that back and forth. And it's especially the case when we uh, find ourselves in a kind of minority situation. And I don't mean that we're minority Muslims just in our numbers, but in the globalized world today, everything that is sacred and spiritual is in the minority. It's not the mass culture that people follow. So we're in a very good um, historical moment to ask ourselves, what is the pedagogy that I want to engage in behind this custom, behind my choice of what I'm going to do on Ashura? What, it, what do I want to accomplish for myself, for my children, for the generation that comes after them? Will they be able to understand the ways that we chose to express this particular occasion? Or do I need to continuously find ways that truly meet the needs? of the, the coming generations. And that's a big part of the work that we're trying to do here at Sana Collective and that is done by many organizations who are trying to forge authentic culture, culture that has meaning, because we won't be able to just tell our kids, you know, do it this way because we've always done it this way. There has to be an understanding, there has to be an intentionality, and it has to flow with our reality. So I just want to say we didn't have this discussion just for the sake of having this discussion of outlining problematic things and you know aspects of our of our history and of our scholarship that are you know sometimes hard to digest for people it's not just for that it's really to remind each and every one of us that uh, how do i want to go forward for my children for the community um, as sheikh hamdi said uh, there isn't this great geographic divide, if there ever really was one, uh, between Shia and Sunni. Yes, to some degree, you can say North Africa, you know, where Sheikh Hamdi is, is originally from, there, there, was a, there, there was an absence of maybe a Shia community there, but in other countries, neighbors. And, and we have to be able to um, understand how to live well with one another and to respect uh, all kinds of people, not just uh, Shia or Sunni, but everybody around us and I would just want to remind us that it's it's these are very important decisions to make as communities as families um, as individuals and so don't shy away uh, from this kind of thinking from this kind of contemplation you don't have a choice as Sheikh Hamdi said you don't have the luxury of, of not having to think about these things you are confronted with not only the questions that we brought up today but a whole other question of why anything at all why, why anything at all? Why should I fast? Why should I mourn? Why should I? It's just another day. It's tomorrow is September 10th. Let's just get on with life. So there are important things that we need to really think about is really to invest the sacred and the, and the, and the personal development aspect 
and the consciousness development aspect that is there in the teaching of the Prophet the ilm, that learning which is consciousness development, developing your consciousness, developing your sense of awareness of what this life is all about and what, who you are, and, and the, the, the personal development which is to become a better person based on that. To be able to take those lessons, as Sheikh Hamdi said, I have, uh, the first time I really heard about uh, Ashura and, and what happened to, to, to Imam Hussein alayhi uh, salam from Sunni scholars was when I was learning in Damascus and I remember my teacher saying subhanallah we, we should never uh, no Sunni should ever mock or, ma or make fun of or deny the value of grieving on this day as we see our Shia brothers and sisters doing in fact you should be crying tears of blood not just crying, you should be crying tears of blood for what happened. And another great sheikha who said, also in, 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 in Syria, who brought it up, this, this question of don't ever take your faith for granted. Be careful and understand what loyalty is. And, and, and be careful how you, where you pledge yourself and what you do with that and how you hold on to that, how you beg God to not let you, as, as, as we read in Surah Al-Fatiha, don't let me become somebody who's blind to the to your beauty and to your blessings. It's, when we were reading Surah Al-Fatiha, it was this whole story. It's this whole story. Don't let me. Don't let the blessings that you've given me become the very reason that I become severed from you. Oh my Lord, that's the story. That's that's part of the sadness of of the story of Imam Hussein. Is again the tragedy of the human being who would sink to that 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 depth that is even even worse than, than, than Satan himself. So these are very profound lessons and uh, if, we can, if we can have this kind of contemplative view as adults and then for our children to, to be very careful what we choose, how we want to raise them, uh, thinking about a sense of responsibility, thinking about a sense of trust in God at the same time and always when we think about teaching our children something that's difficult or something that involves a sense of sadness to, to temper that really with a sense that God is there and that you're not in danger and that you, you're not going to be, uh, the world isn't threatening, um, you know, and you don't have to be afraid that God is there no matter what happens. So these are wonderful, it's really wonderful material if you think about it. And I don't mean that in any sense to belittle. These are realities. The, all of these stories we're talking about, they're profound realities, but they're also gifts from God to say, what are you going to do with this now? This is your inheritance. You are a human being. You know all of these things. You come at the end of time. You have all of this in your hands now. How will you make something beautiful, meaningful, respectful, powerful uh, for your children that will not just give them a nice day, but that will make them better people and that will empower them to face whatever challenges come their way and, may, and allow them to make the right decisions. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to create a culture that reflects the best of, of, of all that we've inherited as human beings and these stories and these traditions from, from both sides in a way that is pleasing to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen, ameen. And uh, you may choose any position. Um, and there is a choice to make, but the only thing that you have no choice about is to really love Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family. The love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the love of Fatima Alayhi Salam, the love of Ali Alayhi Salam, the love of Imam Hassan Alayhi Salam, the love of Imam Hussein Alayhi Salam, the love of those people is not a matter of choice. And I repeat it, if you don't have that love in your heart for these people, no matter what you do, you are not a Muslim. So this is something very important. And for your kids, therefore, also for your kids, choose whatever pedagogy you want. But teaching your kids how to love the Ahl al-Bayt of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also is not a matter of choice. You don't have any choice over that. You have to. Okay, choose any material. At least make ishtihad. 
But it's not something secondary. To teach your kids how to love Imam Hassan, how to love Imam Hussein alayhi salam. And when you say how to love, it's not a romantic love. I'll tell you what to love. Teach your kid, so for him it is clear for me. A kid, if he's a, a, a boy, a 10-year-old boy, and that's late. A seven-year-old boy, and that's not early. When he should be asked, now you travel in this, the history. We put you the day of Karbala. In which clan you will be? What side you will be? He shouldn't be saying, uh, it has to be clear like the sunlight. Absolutely with Hussein. Absolutely with Hussein. And I say it again. If we are Muslims today, and it is not clear in our hearts that if we travel back into time and we have in front of us the army of, let us go back a bit, the army of Imam Ali alayhi salam Allah. And the army of Bani Umayyah and the army of Muawiyah on the other side. غفر الله له وسامحه الله احنا don't curse anyone may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive him and but come on let us not someone oh that's a sahabi and that's a sahabi yeah. let, us, let, us, let us be careful with that we're talking about Ali alayhi salam Allah let us not elevate what God did not and abase what God elevated But anyways, forget, even I said, okay, we'll say, رضي الله عنه. Okay. Even if you choose to say Muawiyah رضي الله عنه, it's your choice. And it has been the choice of some scholars of Ahl Sunnah. The majority we know of Ahl Sunnah, when they mention the name of Muawiyah, they keep silent and say, رحمه الله وغفر الله لا سمح الله. God forgive him for, 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 the, for, the, for the things that he caused, for the, for the problem that he, he, he brought. But we don't, we don't curse, we don't. Because that's not, a, that's not a choice. And what are we teaching people through cursing? We don't even curse shaitan, let alone, let alone people who might have ended as Muslims. We, we never know. You understand? But anyways, CD, I'll take you back. If the day of the Jamal, not Sufi, the army of Imam Ali there and the army of Sayyidah Aisha there. If you travel in history, it should be clear for you, I'll, I'll be with Ali. If you, go back in time. if you go back in time. It has to be clear for the Muslim. And this is Sunnism, this is the true Sunnism. And go and read Abu Hanifa, go and read Imam Shafi'i, go and read Imam Malik, and go and read Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. All of them, all the scholars of Ahl Sunnah, they say, Al Haqq Ma'a Ali. The Haqq was with Ali. That's, I'm, I'm mentioning this because I saw these discussions on internet and this new Sunnism, uh, new Sunnism is very dangerous. It's not Sunni at all. It's not, it doesn't have anything to do with what the scholars of Ahl Sunnah brought up and, and said. It's a new Sunnism. Really, yani people, what are you talking about? Sometimes you see, hmm? they're doubting, oh, it was a matter of ishtihad. It was a matter of opinion. It was a matter of opinion. And actually, I even saw it on the internet, this, uh, this, this, this uh, uh, quote-unquote da'iyah, saying, actually, it was a good thing that Muawiyah became the king because he was able to bring peace. And during his time, 19 years of the kingdom of Muawiyah, it was, it was a peaceful time. Because he was able to maintain and to establish his power. We see this narrative, seriously? It's whitewashed for history. You, you, we don't talk like that. And then what? What are you saying? Oh, because Ali was not able? I, I even saw it. Oh, Ali was good as a alim, but he's not good as a... 
as a politician. Since when it was about politics? فقط لا رأي لمن لا يطاع if you want to learn about Imam Ali عليه السلام الله had he had he had he found the people and he was asked actually during his life time and he was said those people who came with this opinion they told him يا إمام how could we understand that during the time of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab رضي الله عنه the Muslim world was so peaceful and the money of zakat was not even we, we couldn't even find uh, poor people to give them the money of zakat and everything was great flourishing. flourishing and during your time it's war 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 we did not live one day in peace <laughs> to make the answer short Imam Ali told him Omar myself and people like myself for his army for his citizens and army and his citizens and army but myself me yourself and people like yourself are my citizens and army that's the answer. لا رأي لمن لا يطاع. There is no opinion for the one who is not obeyed. Subhanallah, it's a context. You find the, the wisest man when people they choose to. Everyone is Subhanallah. Okay. It's a context. Mashallah. Okay. And you find the stupid man are surrounded by good people. Mashallah. And the wise man surrounded by Subhanallah. Mashallah. Okay. على كل حال. ولا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. It's very very important for us to understand this, and this is not a matter of choice, by the way. You cannot say it's it's because it was not a matter of إجتهاد. The حق was with Ali, hundred percent, full stop, full stop, full stop. If we ask you as a Muslim. Now you go back on in time. Is it still a possibility for you to take the position? I will. I will just sit on the. Sidelines. Huh? On the sidelines. On the sidelines. Because I'm not sure. Because I'm not sure. No, the four imams of Ahl Sunnah are telling you no. You don't have the right. You may tell them, oh, some of the Sahaba they have chosen. To, to sit on the sidelines they were excused because it was uh, things were not clear at that time but now we are not excused the, it was in the heat of the moment at that time so. but now we are not excused because now the history is clear and we know it now for a fact what happened with things with how with how things unfolded after we know for a fact so people who did not know the right from uh, from wrong and they did not know which clan which side. which side and were confused during the time of the fitna they were excused but there is no excuse for someone who comes now and says uh, we don't know if Ali was right or wrong no, no, no. it's part of your aqidah as a Muslim to believe and to know for a fact not only that, it's part of your Islam and Iman as a mu'min. To not only believe, to love. And go and read the literature of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah and teach that literature to your brothers and sisters amongst the Shia. So for them as well, if they were taught that they are the only people loving Ahl Sunnah, Ahl Bayt, and, 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 and while Ahl Sunnah they don't love Ahl Bayt, so at least they. They understand, no, 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 it's wrong. You will be preventing a big war. It's the jihad of our time, reconciling and making people understand. First of all, the children of Ahl Sunnah, they need to understand that the love of Ahl Bayt and the Nusra of Ahl Bayt and being in their, in their sight is not a matter of choice. It's part of our Islam. They will tell you, oh, how about Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Abbas? Why they did not come with Imam al-Hussein? They did not know that there will be any war. Who told you that Imam al-Hussein left for a war? Did he know himself? He left Medina to prevent the war. 
And that was a question that should have been that should have been asked, but we just assume and then or or, or assume that everyone knows what happened to the day of Karbala. The majority they don't know. The majority of Sunnis they, they don't have they don't know. They don't have any clue about it. What happened? And even you, you see. Hmm? The summary of the story, the summary of the story, if it could, if it could be summarized, but actually it, it, it will be very good and that will take one session to just talk about it and just bring the literature of Karbala from the books of Ahl-Sunnah. The literature of Karbala from the books of Ahl-Sunnah. And you will see how much love. And it's not that love of empathy and uh, pity. And, no, no, no. How much loyalty do the scholars of Ahl Sunnah have for the Imams of Ahl Bayt? You will be surprised as someone who was exposed to the new Sunnism of today, somehow pushing to the side. And this is a reality that we need to acknowledge. Pushing to the side. Ahl al Bayt. Pushing Ahl al Bayt to the side impoverishing the Islamic, the Sunni literature. Yani, dramatically, we don't have a hadith. We don't have anything about how Fatima was raising her kids and how Imam Hassan and how Imam Hussein. And we don't have that. The Shia, they have lots of literature about Ahl Bayt. The Sunnis, unfortunately, they don't. Based on what? If they will tell you that, oh, baby, the hadith are not authenticated, if you want to go to the authentication of the hadith, then you are contradicting yourself. Even the hadith about Ashura, they're not authenticated. So choose. Why are you choosing these? And, okay? So, so there, is, there, is, there is a halal, there is a halal manhaji. There, there is a problem um, in, the in the methodology and in the curriculum, I would say, of, of Ahl Sunnah today. And there is, there, there is something. We are not claiming that we'll be solving that whole thing through through this session or or through what we are trying to do. But at least, as the said, Shana said, bring bring good intentions to the table, and and uh, and um, and don't be led by emotions and 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 be smart and be intelligent. It's a deep question. It's a deeper question. There 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 are good things built on bad things, and bad things built on good things. There are good buildings built on foundation. rotten foundations. I'll tell you that. Uh, huh? And there are bad things built on good foundations. On the good foundations of the love of Ahlul Bayt, many bad things are built. And on the good foundations of loving the Sahaba as well, many bad things are built. And on the rotten foundations of Pushing Imam Ali and pushing Sayyidah Fatima and pushing the and pushing Imam Hassan and Hussein to the side and really and making their memory uh, erasing them, huh? erasing them from the from the memory of people. Subhanallah, there are good things built. When you say on that foundation, doesn't mean as a consequence, but just in spite of in spite of in spite of that foundation. In spite of that foundation, our ancestors, they were able to, subhanAllah, and, and, and it's God himself. It's the miracle of God. It's the miracle of God. Yes, there was a time, and still, there are people who hate the Prophet ﷺ, who hate the inheritors of the Prophet ﷺ, and who hate the haqq. And they took it upon themselves to erase their memory. And they took it upon themselves to push them aside and they took it upon themselves to really be against them whatever they can and the sultan of all of these is one shaitan may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from his whispering and from his absolutely that's a reality There are people who are enemies, who, def- who are enemies of prophets and prophets and prophethood and light and khair and, and haqq and truth, truth and, and, goodness. and goodness, absolutely. Still, 
And there, there were people, and they made histories, and they built stories, and they made fake th things, etc. But subhanAllah, in spite of all of that, in spite of all of that, in spite of all of that, you don't find true Muslims today who don't love Ahlul Bayt. Maybe they don't know them, but as soon as they know that Rasulullah had a family, they will, they will just rise in love. Huh? They will rise in love of that family, of those people. As soon as you tell them. Maybe they don't know that, because no one taught them that. But as soon as they know that, it's, it's a fitra. It's just a, natural. It's a natural. It's a natural thing. It's a natural thing. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us and do tawfiq. Ameen ya arhamar rahameen ya rabbil alameen. Ameen ya arhamar rahameen ya rabbil alameen. What you promised, I said, I said I'll, I'll give a summary. The summary, what happened, there was a big confusion in the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu. And I don't want to go before that. And my advice to all those who, who are nuqad of ilm hadith and also those who want to read books. Critics. Don't, critics. Hmm? Nuqad is critics. The critics. The critics of history and the thinkers. My advice for them, my advice for Sunnis and my advice of Shia is please don't go back before Sayyidina Uthman al -Afan. Keep that era of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Keep that era of Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq in the era of Sayyidina Umar and the era of Sayyidina Uthman, the beginning of it, please keep that era away from discussion. From discussion. Because if there is a period that is truly unclear, that's, that would be a period that is. And, 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 and it's not easy to go there. And why would you want to go there? And there is no need to go there. The fitna did not start there. Those who insist that the roots of the fitna of Karbala started the day of the Saqifa are ignorant. Those who insist that the roots of uh, the tragedy of Karbala are to be found the day Rasulullah passed away and the Sahaba they have chosen a Khalifa without consulting with Imam Ali alayhi salam Allah. Huh? are wrong it's not true had that been a good choice or a mistake I mean the fact that the Sahaba they consulted amongst themselves and they have chosen a Khalifa who was Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu arda huh? and without consulting with Imam Ali alayhi salam Allah and without consulting with Umm al-Mu'mineen Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam Allah had that been right or wrong had that been good or uh, a good decision or a bad decision scientifically speaking that could not be the root and the foundation for the tragedy of Karbala no no and as a Sunni, I believe that Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq was the rightful Khalifa. And we say, Radiallahu Anhu, and we say, Alayhi Salamullah. And I invite all Muslims to believe the same thing. But I do not consider those who do not believe the same thing as Kuffar. Why? Because the Imams of Ahl Sunnah, they say, Yulan Kafiruhum. Those who believe that it must, it should have been Ali after Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they are free to believe that. But they are, they, that doesn't make them not Muslims or we shouldn't. It's not like the love of Ahl al-Bayt. The love of Ahl al-Bayt is a matter of aqid. If you don't love them, you are not Muslim. Huh? The hierarchy between the Khulafa al-Rashidin and believing that Abu Bakr Siddiq was the best uh, candidate of his time is not a matter of aqid. It shouldn't be a matter of aqidah, even though we find it in some texts of the aqidah, like uh, the aqidah al tahawi etc. He said, na'taqidu, it's, it's actually a recommendation 
the, the, in the commentaries you find it that he's saying that as he's recommending that way, that view, that point of view. But it's not aqidah, by the way. Um, but we believe and we invite all Muslims to believe that Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq and to keep Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq above. As if he was ma'asum. As if he was... Uh, protected from error. Protected from error. It's better, pedagogically speaking. Yes, we can learn from the errors of the Sahaba, but not those ones. We need some of them. We need to keep some of them above our discussions. We need. It's a need. We need. It's a need. Hmm? And that should be Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq, alayhi salam, Allah, wardullahu anhu wa arda and his time. And now to go and you find in some literatures, by the way, Imam Ali, alayhi salam, Allah, he did not want to fight the Hurub al-Ridda because he did not agree with, with Sayyidina Abu Bakr. And go, to go that far, and all of that story of Fadak, and all of that, one day, inshallah, we'll teach a class on the Islamic history. But from now, I'm telling you, we can discuss, we can examine the facts, we can bring the narrations, but I will tell you from now that they were played with in the most spectacular way. It's the most unclear period, that's why I said, the most unclear period. In terms of the records. In terms of the records. The period of Sayyidina Bakr Radwanullah, the period of Sayyidina Umar Radwanullah, and the period of Sayyidina Uthman, and how they became Khulafa. Most unclear period. Now we say Sayyidina Bakr alayhi radhwanullah was the Khalifa after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. After that it became Sayyidina Umar radhullahu anhu. After that Sayyidina Uthman radhullahu anhu. And we believe it was a good thing. The only thing that makes me believe that it is a good thing is that Imam Ali radhullahu anhu as a Sunni. And this is the way I see things, and I invite people to see things this way. What is my warranty? That Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq was a good Khalifa, and Sayyidina Umar was a good Khalifa, and Sayyidina Uthman was a good Khalifa, and that, that was a good decision. And had I been, uh, if, I, if, I travel, if I travel back also in time, if I, if I go back in time as, as a Muslim, I'll, I'll give bay'ah to Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq after Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and I'll give bay'ah to Sayyidina Umar al-Khattab Rasulullah Anhu after Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq and I'll give bay'ah to Sayyidina Uthman after Sayyidina Umar. Why? Because Ali did that. Full stop. Full stop. Absolutely he wasn't. Who, who would coerce him? So these narrations that, oh, he was coerced and he had to or, or he was hiding his position. Or, are you praising Ali or abasing Ali? Can you rise above? He's above. His name is above. Ta'ala Ali عَلَيْكَ عُلُوًا كَبِيرًا He's above all of that. You... And this narration that, okay, even if you find it in some, some of them, by the way, are in a hadith that somehow hmm, were authenticated. That Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu one day he was so upset that Sayyidina Ali did not give bay'ah to Sayyidina Bakr Siddiq. Hmm? So he went to the house with the fire and he was threatening that he, I'll, I'll burn the house. And he, he, he broke the door. And the Shia, they will add, and actually he, Sayyidina, Sayyidina Fatima opened the door for him. So he actually pushed her. All of that, astaghfirullah. Could we please keep the giants giants? Could you please keep those who are above above? Don't bring them to this. And there is no need. There is no need to go back to uh, scrutinize that period and that era. There is no need. It's period of Al Khilaf al Rashid, a full stop. It's a glory. It's a, it's, it's a good period. There has been some misunderstandings, absolutely. You know, but it was a golden era. Those 30 years are not to be questioned. I mean, 
the not what happened in them, but the, 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 those five caliphs, Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Umar al Khattab radiallahu anhu, Uthman radiallahu anhu, Ali alayhi salamullah wa radiallahu anhu, Al Hasan alayhi salamullah wa radiallahu anhu. Those five caliphs are not to be. So the roots are to be found during the time of Sayyidina Uthman, not in Sayyidina Uthman, during the time of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, radiallahu anhu arda. The geography, uh, ge- geographically speaking, the, the Muslim land became very vast, very vast, huge. Um, Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan kept using and he used lots of uh, uh, people who were smart, who knew how to deal, who, who knew Latin, who knew the language, Latin. Who they, he needed people who know how to read and write, and people who know Latin, and people who know how to deal with, uh, with kings, uh, Roman kings and Roman princes, and people of Al Kitab, especially to not uh, uh, diplomats. And for a fact, Muawiyah was a diplomat. and son of a diplomat. So, he was given, and also at some point, the, those people, even in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, at the end of the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when they became Muslims, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave them, and he showed us, how to deal with people when they come, even if they were your enemies all their lives, now they came, he did not uh, keep abasing them. Or he honored them. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi brought uh, uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and even Abu Sufyan himself closer, etc. But we have to say that those people were not actually educated. The way Abu Bakr was educated, the way Sayyidina Umar was educated, the way Sayyidina Uthman himself was educated, the way Sayyidina... Ali was educated the way the, the Sahaba who lived with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they all their lives were educated. So as soon as Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed away, and at some point when those people, we can actually talk about them without making takfir of them. And there is no need. I have no need to say Muawiyah was a kafir. But it is a fact and I, Abdullah, as a Muslim, as a Sunni Muslim, I have to say, I need to say that Muawiyah was wrong. It's part of my deen to say that Muawiyah was wrong. Kafir Muslim between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'd better to believe that he was Muslim. This is something that many Muslims today, many new Sunnis today, Neo Sunnis, I'm calling them the Neo Sunnis. They don't know. They think it's actually, no, no, listen. It's not Muawiyah radiallahu anhu on one side and no, 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 it's not. Muawiyah maraqa an al khilaf al rashida. And he had no excuse. He had no excuse. Muawiyah committed the biggest sin. And he had no excuse when he did not follow the Khalifa that the Muslims had appointed, who was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He started that innovation and he brought da'wah jahiliyyah. He brought something from the time of jahiliyyah and he said, listen, these six people were involved in killing. We have news. I know for a fact that those six people, and one of them was an innocent person, Sayyidina Muhammad ibn al-Hanafi, uh, not Muhammad al-Hanafi, astaghfirullah, uh, Sayyidina uh, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, radiallahu anhu, wa arda. We know for a fact that he was innocent, he had nothing to do with that. His name was brought in that list, alongside with three other innocent people, as the killers of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, 
when Sayyidina Uthman was killed, we know that Sayyidina Uthman was killed during the civil war. A confusion, a time of confusion that the Sahaba could not handle. Part of it because the majority of the Sahaba were not in Medina. And the Sahaba became minority in Medina. The majority of the Sahaba were in Egypt and Iraq and Khalas. It's, it's, you can imagine the, the, the small number of the Sahaba, uh, those who, who are still alive after Rasulullah Wasallam, they are now teaching people in North Africa, in Syria, in Iraq, in Iran. So the Medina at some point, very few Sahaba stayed in Medina. Very, very few, very few, very few. And those visitors, they came from, from Iraq and from, from, from Syria. And if you want to believe in this conspiracy theory, I believe that the majority of them were sent by, by the clan of Bani Umayyah, Muawiyah or people with Muawiyah, to outnumber the, the shuyukh of the Sahaba in Medina and also to create this fitna because to harvest the fruits of the fitna after that. It's political intrigue. Because they knew for a fact if after Sayyidina Uthman and Affan, if he leaves, even Sayyidina Uthman and Affan, we see, we know in the history that he was not happy with them. And he kept sending letters to, uh, to uh, Ya'zal, to, uh, to ask them to step down. Asking them to step down. Hmm? Asking Muawiyah to step down, asking, 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 the the, asking the, the governors from, from the family of Bani Umay to step down, but they, they refused. They resisted the power. They challenged it and resisted the power of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan first. And they ended up, if not assassinating him, not sending. Where was your army? You found an army after that to fight Imam Ali. Where was your army? To defend your own Khalifa. They left him completely unguarded. And Ungu completely unguarded, well, Sayyidina Uthman well. was left in Medina completely unguarded. And the few Sahaba who remained in Medina, Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib al Hassan al Hussein, they were, they were trying to protect Sayyidina Uthman al Uthman <coughs> from the, these youth who did not know even how, he, how did he look like. How old was he? They were just pushed, they were just put in that, okay, go on, just. You know what? The mother of the believer they said, kill, kill Uthman. Based on a propaganda like that, and they, it was a fitna, it was a civil war. And we can understand that it was a time where many things, we can, we can talk long and who participated in that. Just to, to give a summary, yeah, absolutely. Some Jewish people of that time who claimed to be Muslims, but they were not. And some people from also Quraysh who claimed that they embraced Islam and they were not. And they made a coalition. They made a coalition. Together to just, you know, to break. break. Shaitan is the emir of all of them. And we know for a fact. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in the Quran. Would Shaitan leave the legacy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam untouched like that? Absolutely. He would try his best. And that's why I'm, I'm uh, to defy that. Uh, that's why I'm trying to, that's why I'm, I feel actually it's a good thing to talk about that history. Because, because when I see, in spite of all of that, we still say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a victory. And all Muslims believe that Ali was Waliullah. Some of them they mentioned in the Adhan, some of them they don't mention it. That's a matter of fiqh ijtihad. But you are not a Muslim if you don't believe that Ali waliullah. If you don't believe that Ali was a lie of God and is a saint and is the master of saints. You are not a Muslim full stop. Now if you don't believe that Muawiyah was a Muslim, it's not a, that big deal. If you don't want to say Muawiyah or if you want to believe that Muawiyah was a kafir, I will, I will, I will, I want, I will tell you, you don't need to. But that doesn't take, that doesn't, that doesn't make you non-Muslim. You, you see the, the, the difference. It's not the same. لا يستوون. Allah said it in the Quran. لا يستوون. 
They're not the same. They're not the same. Now, على كل حال during the time of سيدنا عثمان بن عفان رضي الله عنه and that's something to mourn also. The day, يوم الدار, the day سيدنا عثمان was martyred. It's also a day to be mourned. Like the day of Karbala. Alongside. And let us make morning day. To mourn Sayyidina Uthman and Sayyidina Ali and Sayyidina Umar and Sayyidina Al-Hasan. Who's poisoning his house? And Sayyidina Al-Hussein alayhi salam Allah. Why only mourning Sayyidina Al-Hussein alayhi salam Allah? Yes, it is more shocking. The tragedy of Imam Al-Hussein was more shocking. But also the tragedy of Sayyidina Uthman was shocking. Very shocking. These youth who do not know anything about Islam. Who do not know anything about the ancestors. Coming and killing. An old man reading Quran in his mihrab. Just when you think of the, 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 steps, it took. the steps of sacredness that they had to... Violate. Violate one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. What In his home, his private home. In his home. And just also let us make a morning day, all our ancestors and Habib Aydarus, who was assassinated also in his mihrab, praying, praying duha and reciting Surah al duha Two years ago. Two years ago. Sheikh huh? Sayyid Ramadan al Burti. Let us make a morning day. It's shocking. Is it? Is, it's shocking, and they're all Karbala yet. They're all Karbala moments. They're all Karbala moments. You know? Karb wa bala. They are all karb and bala moments. Karb, great difficulty. Bala means big test. Subhanallah. And also the idea of bringing it on yourself. A community that brings that kind of a bala on, on, on themselves by, by breaking the sacred. Breaking the sacred and, and not... See what comes after that. Allahu Akbar. See what comes after that. See and what will happen to an entire country or an entire community once, you, once even a few are allowed to take that kind of step. It just opens the gates of hell. So those who killed Sayyidina Uthman, radiallahu anhu, they opened the gates of hell. Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu wa arda, was uh, obliged. Noblesse oblige. He was obliged to become the Khalifa after that. It wasn't his choice. It wasn't something that he wanted. It wasn't something that he was waiting for, he was waiting for or seeking. But he was the only one. This time, you, you are the only one who can save us. And people amongst them, Sayyidina Aisha, Talha, Zubayr, they want to Sayyidina Ali, said, you are the only one who can, you can handle this. And Sayyidina Ali, would, yeah, Zubayr, Talha, could you? Could you take this? Make a coalition. Be two governors, be six in the same time. Why me now? Tell them, you have to take it. And we have to believe as Muslims, had it not been for Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib. And all these wars, one after the other, we wouldn't have Islam today. You have to understand, you have to understand. It's not just war, war, war. It's the resistance of the battle. Don't be silly, don't be, oh, uh, it's too much, it's anxiety, it's war. Yeah, but it's not a choice, but sometimes only war could, you know. It's, it's fighting the good fight. You have to stand in the face of evil. And he had to fight. He had to fight, alayhi salam, Allah, nonstop. Non-stop, 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 non-stop. And all kinds of awaj of humanity, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of, all kinds of um, crookedness yeah. of a human being. Subhanallah. Came in front of him. 
He was like that magnet. All kind of crookedness. All kind of ugliness manifested in front of him. From the extreme to the extreme. From those who believed that he was God and prostrated to him. <laughs> to those who believed that he was Satan. He was the incarnation of Satan. And they cursed him on the members for years. I, I invite everyone to read the history because this crookedness they needed to manifest and shaitan prepared those crookedness and those, uh, those, uh, huh? they, those toxins. Those, those toxins, they needed the antidote. And that antidote was Ali ibn Abi Talib. And that's why he, he was there. He was created for that. And had it, had it been any other man, he wouldn't be able to handle all of that. And he was successful. We need to read our history in this way. He was very successful. How do I know he was successful? Because I still say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you still say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is the success of Imam Ali. As a Sunni, you have to believe like this. As a Sunni, this is your, 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 your narrative. We are Muslims. Thanks to Imam Ali. Had it not been for Imam Ali fighting the good fight, things would have fallen apart. Hmm? Things would have fallen apart at that point. Things would have fallen apart. Things would have fallen apart. And the whole legacy would have been dropped. I mean, he was carrying the baton at, at the hardest moment of the whole marathon. But materially speaking, subhanallah, finally Imam Ali radiallahu anhu الله, was martyred after Safin and things were not were still unclear and the Muslims were still divided. Uh, let me go back. So Sayyidina Uthman alayhi radiallahu he was martyred in his house and after that we have the Muslims the shuyukh, the elders of Muslims, they have chosen Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib, and when you choose a Khalifa, you have to obey the Khalifa. And Sayyidina Ali ibn Abi Talib said, no, 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 the matter is not that easy. You cannot give me a list of six names. Four of them are innocent, for a fact. And I know for a fact that they were innocent. Four of them. Huh? Okay. I know for a fact that Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr was giving water to Uthman. He was not killing. So if that lady... The wife of Sayyidina Uthman, she saw Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr in the house. He was giving water. He was not involved in, 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 in killing Sayyidina Uthman. For a fact, I know that. I sent him to give water. So what are you talking about? But you want us to investigate about all of this? How did it, how? I, I, I'm the judge. I'm the one, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Aqwa Ali. I'm the best Qadi. Amongst Muslims, even if you don't want to believe that I'm the best companion, I'm the best Qazi. I'm the best judge. Okay? So let me, let me investigate. Let me investigate. But those people, they knew, if he would start the investigations, they would be the first people to be. Found. No, 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 no. They made a fake shirt. And they put some blood of uh, chicken on it or something like that. And Qamis Uthman, Qamis Uthman, Qamis Uthman, Qamis Uthman. The shirt of Uthman. The shirt of Uthman. The, the true shirt of Uthman. Radallahu anhu wa arda was honored, was buried with Uthman. How do I know? That's how we do with because that's how we do with martyrs. We don't wash there is no way that Imam Ali would have left Shirt. These kids of Bani Umayya play with the shirt of Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan. It's a sacred thing. You don't take anything, any garment from the shaheed, the martyr. You bury him the way he was martyred. And we know for a fact that who buried Sayyidina Uthman? Sayyidina Ali al Hassan al Hussein.
they were there. Sayyidina Uthman passed away like that, and those people, they started, and, and those people, this clan of Syria, they started, no, 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 you have to give us the six people. I'm not giving you six people, but I want to investigate. First of all, step down. Let me repair a few, few things. First of all, you step down. Number two, I'm going to call you to court. And you bring what you have. And there are some things against you. No, absolutely not. Absolutely, they resisted that, and they made that whole thing, and they brought some of the Sahaba uh, w with them in the beginning, uh, in the first one, and in the second, but we know as Ahl Sunnah for a fact now, if, if, if during that time, it was a time of confusion, now we have no excuse. And no doubt about it, we have the Ahadith Sahih, and we have everything, and we know for a fact that. So, for any Sunni, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings you back in, time. back in time, you'll have to be with Ali. If you are not sure, go and renew your Islam. Full stop. And who, who says this? Sheikh Bouti taught me this. I'm taking it from him directly. Said anyone who has, he said, if I am, he was crying, said, if I travel back, absolutely I will be with Ali. But I have no interest in cursing anyone. or making takfir or mu'awiyah. I believe he was a sahabi and radiallahu anhu and, but he was not ma'asum. He made mistakes, major mistakes, absolutely. Major mistakes, may Allah forgive him. The sins and the mistakes of some people, they don't justify the mistakes of those who come after them. They become just a context. But everyone has a freedom to write the text he wants to write. Sayyidina Ali Nabi Talib was the Khalifa and during his time he had to fight all of these. Then he was killed himself at the door of the masjid at Fajr time before, Sahar, before the Fajr time. Sayyidina Al Hassan ibn Ali, he was after that chosen to be the, to be the Khalifa. Who chose him? The elders of Muslims. How about the people of Syria? The people of Syria, they were not considered as part of the Ummah at the time. They were considered as Mariqeen, as Fasiqeen, as people, uh, uh, as people who, were, uh, who were defying the central authority. As extremists, like ISIS today, basically. Or yesterday, it's not, it doesn't exist today anymore. Huh? You understand? Yeah. Renegades. Renegades, hmm? basically. Hmm? Renegades. But they had power. They had power. They had lots of power. And Imam al Hassan and Imam al Hussein, who was his uh, huh? Mustashar, his brother and his advisor. And his advisor. And his minister. They looked at the situation. Particularly one night. They were already thinking, should we really continue this? If we win the war against Muawiyah, what would that bring to Muslims? What good would that bring to Muslims? And they, they were like... Studying the pros and cons of them. Huh? Weighing the options. Weighing the options. Is that the priority now? And they were thinking about it because they saw that even Imam Ali, عنه, at the end of his life, he kind of, he cooled down. Huh? He, he, he let, go of, he let go of that issues. chapter and he went to another chapter that was more urgent. 
It was the chapter of the Khawarij, the Kharijite. Who are the Kharijite? Mutants. Mutants. Dangerous species. Dangerous species. From a pedagogical point of view, it is a mutation in the mentality, in the Islamic mentality. And that was the danger. Finding people who would kill other Muslims and pregnant women. And, and you understand? It's like, like what we solve ISIS to. Huh? That, that was the priority. So I'm not going to keep fighting with my eyes, just some, someone who is looking after, after dunya, uh, uh, running after, running after dunya at least. Power. Uh, this is something more dangerous here. And that's the priority. There is a crisis in education already, and big crisis. A generation of people who do not listen to any Sahabi, who don't consider any authority over them, and they will just read the Qur'an and say, La hukum illa lillah. We read the Qur'an and they will understand the Qur'an the way I read it and then that's it. And I will say only God has authority. And only God has authority over me. Fighting those people was... Priority. Was priority. Because they were the highway robbers and they were killing and they were... <laughs> and they were claiming godliness. I mean, they were claiming to be the, the true Muslims. That was their rhetoric. Imam al-Hassan ibn Ali came and people came to him and gave him bay'ah and Muawiyah did not want to give bay'ah, of course. And he was, he declared himself king of Syria and independent. independent. And some people in Syria, they want to give him bay'ah as a caliph. Now we have two caliphs, can't be. So the elders of Muslims, they came to Imam al-Hasan, radiallahu anhu, alayhi salam, Allah, they told him, you have no choice but to go and fight this pretended caliph. He's an imposter. Scientifically speaking, Muhawiyah was an imposter. I'm not saying he was careful. Imposter. You have to. You have to say he was imposter. Otherwise, do not understand anything. Otherwise, you don't even understand politics, I mean. You don't understand religion. There was a Khalifa because it wasn't part of politics. Khilafa is part of the religion. It's not part of the politics. It's not like the politics of today. It's not like people wanting, claiming power. No, no, no. Khilafa is a sacred institution. Be careful. We have a sacred institution on that hand. Imam al-Hasan, alayhi salam, Allah is the, the, the caliph, the Amir al muminin And on the other hand, you have an imposter. A pretended Kayla. But the night, in their way, on, the, on their way, the history tells us this moment. Imam Hassan saw in his dream his mother, Sayyidah Fatima, and his father telling him, No, stop. And his mother to, t telling him, Go and see your army. With which army you are fighting? So they were on their way to fight they were Muawiyah. They were on their way to fight Muawiyah. And they were outnumbering Muawiyah. And Sayyidina al-Hasan went. And he listened. He found on, in some tents people. And he, he put his... Uh, his qina, uh, his... Uh, his he hid his face. Huh? Same for Sayyidina Hussein. And they went to investigate. They found people eating, people drinking and people talking tomorrow. In the army encampment. The wives of Sham, you know how beautiful are they? The women of Sham. You know how fat is the wife of Muawiyah? I'll get it, no, I'll get it, no, I'll take it, no, you'll take it. That kind of discussions, disgusting discussions. Huh? More than that, you take Egypt, you take Aleppo, I take Damascus. Do you understand? That's what the soldiers were talking about. That's what the soldiers and the lieutenants, mm -hmm. the ones in charge, the chief of tribes, the coalition, they were talking about. Oh, 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 oh. 
So I have problem here. Removing a dictator or removing a king to have those people. These people absolutely, they will give bay'ah to Hamam Hassan today and tomorrow they will kill him. And he knew them already. They'll cause more trouble than it's worth. And they will cause more trouble. At least leave it to Muawiyah, at least he will keep the ummah as a... as one block at least. Hmm? These people are already dividing it before they... He called Muawiyah and he sent him a letter and he, and he gave him bayah. Okay, you are the Khalifa now. Okay. Let, let not Muslims have an imposter over them. You are a Khalifa over all Muslims. He made him Muslims. legitimate. By giving him allegiance, he made him legitimate. Imam al-Hussein was there and he agreed. Not only he agreed, he gave that advice. And the pact was, Muawiyah, you take the Sultan, you take the governance. We are going to build the first university. We want to teach. We want to nuslah fi ummati jaddina. We want to teach full time now. We can't keep doing this. We want to teach full time. And if you want to understand why the time of Muawiyah was the most peaceful time, because Imam Hassan and Hussein alayhima salamullah were teaching good people there. And they were teaching generations for 19 years. 19? Muawiyah, he governed for 19 or 18? 19. 19 years. Hmm? They were teaching in Medina. And Muawiyah was sending them money. Sometimes. Huh? Because that was a pact. That was the agreement. That was the agreement. Let not some new Sunnis today say, oh, look at Hassan, he sold the Khilafah for money. Astaghfirullah, what money? He asked that money from Bayt al-Mal to be able to keep building charity institutions and take care of orphans and, and, and take care of and, 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 build, and build educational institutions. That's what, what Ahl al-Bayt were bought and were born for. They were born to teach. to teach. They were born to educate and forge healthy personalities. That's what Ahl al-Bayt is. Ahl al-Bayt is a, an educational institution. First of all, first and foremost, Ahl al-Bayt is an educational institution. It's a curriculum, like what you say Montessori today or Waldorf or that's what Ahl al-Bayt is. The school of Ahl al-Bayt is to teach people how to be healthy Muslims. Thanks to these 19 years, we have what we, talk, what we call Islam today. And we have what we call Ahl al-Sunnah today. And we have what we call the Madhab Imam Malik and Amal Ahl al-Madina. Who taught, who taught Ahl al-Madina how to their Amal? We just told you that the Sahaba were a minority in Medina in the time of Sayyidina Uthman. Who taught the people of Medina the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam think and read between the lines? Who? Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein. For 19 years. And not only the people of Medina, North Africa. Iraq. Egypt. And even Syria. Even Syria. Some of the companions who were the advisors of, uh, of Muawiyah, and they were like, not advisors, they were there, they have chosen to stay. Where did they learn their religion? Who was the authority? Imam al Hassan was the authority. He was the Alim Ahl al Madina. And people were coming to him from all over the world to learn from him. Alayhi Rizwan Allah wa alayhi salam Allah. He signed that pact with Muawiyah the same way Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has chosen to sign the pact of Hudaybiyah. Because there was need for time of peace and the priority is to educate the personality. Amir Abdul Qadir Jazairi signed the pact with the Kafir. With the French colonizer. With the condition to let him teach Islam 
and keep the Arabic language as the language of, of, of Algeria. Get to go on the priority. What is the priority? At some point. At some point. What is the priority? If you don't have healthy personalities, what are you going to do with them? Even if you become victorious. Okay, victorious with whom? Muslims of today. Today as Muslims, and I'm sorry, it, it, the, the discussion went so long, but for those who can benefit, Muslims today. Let us say today God gives the Muslims Jerusalem. What are we going to do? Ask yourself. Ask yourself. I can't even imagine the massacres that will happen. Not only against Jews, against Muslims, against, against cats, against dogs, against trees, against everything. Everything. Are we ready? Do we have healthy personalities to handle that kind of political victory? It is actually a victory, a prophetic victory, that we are not getting victory. It is part of the victory of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we are humiliated on earth today because we are not ready. With what? With what personality? What are we going to teach the world? What ethics? What behavior? Think about it. Just think about it. Yalla, choose the best king you have in the Muslim world or the best movement you have in the Muslim world. The best, huh? And give them an army and Bismillah, Yalla, Jerusalem is yours. What are they going to do? Hmm? Just think about it yourself. Would you be comfortable to go and move there? Personally, to live under that? You'd be much happier to stay here. And you'd feel much safer where you are. Hmm? So, so you understand that, subhanAllah, we are not people who deserve victory. That kind of victory, it is actually part of the, the God's victory, the divine victory and prophetic victory that people like us are not in power. In power. So what do we need before talking about Imam Mahdi, etc.? We need to prepare the soldiers of Imam Mahdi. Healthy personalities. Look at the loyalty of people today. People that give you bay'ah today, tomorrow they run away. And they start talking bad about you. I don't want Imam Mahdi to meet these people. Really. I don't want Imam Mahdi to meet the people I met. I don't. I pray that he gets more delayed until another species, as, as, uh, until another kind of human beings emerges. emerges. People who, are, who know what loyalty is. People who know what promise is. People who know what God is. What godliness is about. And what loving the Prophet is about. Seriously, think about it. Think about it. So that why, that's why Imam al-Hassan, he stepped back. And it was the wisest decision. And why I'm teaching this? Because when you go on the internet, you will find all kinds of things. Especially those who want the revolutionary style. And they're trying to paint Imam al-Hussein as the young revolutionary versus Imam al-Hassan as the one who, you know what, be careful. These are images. The reality is different. And Imam Hussein was not young, by the way, during the day of Karbala. He was over 55. He was a sheikh already. His beard was white. Alayhi salam Allah. The day of Karbala. His beard was white. He was a sheikh. He was an elder. He was almost 60. He had grandchildren. Don't imagine him this 24 or this 33 young man fighting over power. Think, think and read the history. He was 33 
when Ali alayhi salam Allah passed away already 33 of the time like Ali was 33 when Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam passed away so when we read we understand and we when we read between the lines we understand things Bismillah after that the greed and the pact was after after the time of Muawiyah if Hassan is alive the Khilafah goes back to Hassan if Hassan is not alive the Khilafah goes back to Hussein that was the pact we know it so first of all, they killed Imam Hassan. They poisoned him. They sent someone to poison him. Now they say it was his wife. Astaghfirullah. No, it wasn't his wife. They poisoned him. Imam Hassan, alayhi salam, Allah, died as a martyr in his house. During the time of Muawiyah, so there wasn't a problem because Muawiyah was the Khalifa and Imam Hussein he signed the pact and he agreed that Muawiyah was the Khalifa until he passes away. But now Muawiyah passes away and Yazid inherits, inherits the Khilafah. Wait a minute, the Khilafah is not to be inherited. No? It's not hereditary. It's not a dynasty here. Wait, the elders of Muslims, they have to choose the Khalifa, and they have chosen already. They have chosen. If Muawiyah passes away, who's the Khalifa? Imam al Hussein. The bay'ah was made. So that's why those who say Khilafa Rashid, the Khalifa Rashid number six was Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam Allah, absolutely. He was the Khalifa. Oh, wow, well, they did not give him the bay'ah, it was given to him 20 years ago. It was given in the wasiyah. The elders of Muslims, they have the right to choose the Khalifa, the next Khalifa. They are, yes, they have. It was a pact that Imam Hassan agreed upon. Not interested. Hmm? That's it. It was a pact that the elders of Muslims, all the Muslims, all, A-L-L, all the Muslims, including the elders of Syria, they all agreed. If خلاص معاوية is the Khalifa, اجتمعنا. If Muawiyah passes away, when during the life of Imam Hassan, عليه السلام الله, Imam Hassan is the Khalifa. If Imam Hassan is not alive, it goes back to Imam Hussein. If neither of them is alive, are alive, the elders of Muslims of that time they have to to choose Khalifa. Hussein was alive. <laughs> but they insisted that Yazid will be the king. And that's why the one who said Khalifa, no, Khalas al Khilafa ended. Muawiyah, yes, was a Khalifa for a part of his life, these 19 years, after Imam al Hassan gave him bay'ah. Muawiyah was a, a Khalifa, a Caliph, sacred institution, yes. A caliph because Imam Hassan said he gave him bayah. For those years, before that, he was a, an imposter. Yazid was never a khalifa. Khalas, the dynasty started there. Mulk, Adhuz, monarchy attached to the throne, as Rasulullah described it. And even the Khilaf of Muawiyah itself, it was a mulk in its nature, the way he dealt with things. He did not deal with things the way a Khalifa would deal with things. He followed the paradigm of kings. What is the paradigm of kings? Read Machiavelli. Do you know from where Machiavelli brought his book? Huh? 
he, he, he translated it as a translation of a book from the Muslim literature. Hmm? The prince. The prince. The prince. It was. A, it was. A, it, it, it's Muslim literature in the beginning. So to understand how Bani Umayya dealt with the world, huh? the, ends the ends justify the means. To understand how Bani Al-Abbas uh, uh, ruled the world. Do whatever you need to do. I, I forgot the title of the book that was written to advise one of the kings of, uh, of uh, Ben al-Abbas. And that's the book that became, that was translated, translated by, Ma by Machiavelli to become the prince. But we understand that was the way. That's how kings deal with things still. Until now. Any king, he will be following Machiavelli. You won't find a king who is not for Even Salah al-Din Ayyub. Even Salah al-Din Ayyub, he was Malik Salah, but he was a king. Was he a Khalifa? He was not a Khalifa. It's a different institution. It's a different institution. Salah al-Din Ayyub was a good king. He was a virtuous king. Was he a Khalifa? He wasn't. He was a virtuous king. Even virtuous kings, they still, if, if, if it's not them, people around them, they are used to the, to the modalities and the system of? Kingship. Of kingship. There is a way. It's a milieu. That's how it is. That's how it is. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam Allah, absolutely, he was forced and obliged, and then we have to believe in this, to not give bay'ah to Yazid. He is the Khalifa. <laughs> He can't abscond his role. He is the Khalifa. He was voted to be the Khalifa 20 years ago. Now this is an imposter. <coughs> and not a guided one. And not a good one. Go and read what Abu Hanifa says about Yazid. Go and read what Imam Shafi'i says about Yazid. Go and read what all the scholars of Muslims, including Ibn Taymiyyah, Say about Yazid. Go and read. And not only Imam al Hussein, all the elders of Medina and the elders of Mecca and the elders of Hijaz, none of them gave bayat to Yazid. Imam Hussein was in Hajj. And the people of Mecca, they told him, stay with us and we'll fight with you. He said, no, no, no. My father and my brother and my grandfather, they all told me that this haram, Mecca and Medina, they will be uh, uh, their sacredness will be uh, violated, breached because of uh, because of a kabish, because of a book emissaire, because of a, a book emissaire, and because of a black sheep. Because of a sheep. Because of, basically, because of a man. And I don't want to be that man. Who was that man? Allah ibn Zubayr. After that, but Abdullah Zubair was basically well established in Mecca already. Huh? Escape a scapegoat. A scapegoat. Huh? Uh. Abdullah Zubair was already established in, in Mecca, and other Sahaba say Abdullah ibn Abbas as well. He was in Mecca, uh, and, and they all told said Abdullah ibn Umar was in Mecca as well. Hmm? They all told Sayyidina Hussein alayhi salam Allah, stay with us, stay here. He said, those people, do you, don't you understand? As long as I am alive, 
And as long as those thousands of people who were waiting for the day I become the Khalifa are alive, that king there will never be able to sleep in peace. He will kill me. He will have to. One plus one equal two. I know how kings think. If I stay in Mecca, he will come and find me in Mecca. If I go to Medina, he will come and find me in Medina. Let me at least leave and go with my family somewhere far away from the Haram. If people, if things are good there, and I find an army and followers and they are good and well educated, one day, if not me, Allahu Akbar, if not me, my inheritors, huh? will reclaim. Will reclaim. The Khilafah. If things are not good, at least I'll be far away from the... The heartland. Sacred. The sacred land. So I won't be drawing attention to the sacred land. I won't be the reason. I won't be the reason for the violation of the sacred land. Let people go and just do Hajj and Umrah in Medina and Mecca. Let this, that, that, that land has to be haram and amina. People are, they need a place far away from, for centuries, for years now. I said, we spent with my brother 19 years. 19 years I spent with my brother to bring back peacefulness and sacredness to Medina and Mecca. Because Medina and Mecca during the time of Sayyidina, even, even during the time of Sayyidina Ali, why did Sayyidina Ali leave Medina? The three Khulafa, Medina was their capital, except Imam Ali. Why his capital, he, he, he found his capital in Iraq? Why? Because he wanted actually to spare Medina, to keep Medina, Medina. He wanted the Muslims to go there and just be able to nurture a relationship with their Prophet والسلام, without having to huh? be threatened, knowing that kings will actually violate any, any city. Nothing is sacred. Nothing is sacred for a king. Nothing is sacred for kings. Nothing. It's a fact. It's a reality. Imam al Hussein, he followed the path of his dad. I'm not going to stay here. He went to Iraq. It's not because he received their letters and he believed them. No. Do you believe that Imam al Hussein was that silly? He's the son of whom? You believe that Imam al Hussein, he actually believed that the promise of the people of Iraq, he knows them. He did not go to the people of Iraq because he believed that they were actually following him and they will actually fight with him and alongside and they... No, no. But just... And he was not necessarily going to Iraq. According to some narrations, he was going to North Africa. According to other narrations, he wanted to go to Yemen. Most precisely, Ethiopia. That part in Africa now, that part of Yemen in Africa, or that part of Africa in Yemen, Ethiopia. He wanted to go there. Actually, his children, after that, they went there. Many hijras happened, and the hijra of Ahlul Bayt was there, and to North Africa after that. He was thinking of place. And according to other narrations, he, was, he, was, he wanted to go to Caucasus, to, 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 to Caucasus. 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 Anatolia. It was already Muslim. And from there, go to Europe and go to... He wanted to just, you know...
had so much to offer. He had so much to offer. And he was having that hope, even though he knew that he was going to be killed. He had that hope that when the army of Yazid will find him only with women and kids, they will at least let him go and understand that he is not fighting and that he was not going to fight. He wanted to really, he did not lose hope in them until the end. He showed them a baby at some point. The first night, he spent the night giving them water, by the way. The first night when they came, he spent the night giving them water. The army of Yazid. And he spoke to them. And he was telling them, you can, you, you, why are you? And after giving them water and food, some of them are a good man. Some of them, do you know who, who am I? I said, no. What, what are you here for? I said, we are here to, for, for this, this boat who is thirsty for power and thirsty for blood called Hussein. I am Hussein. How could, how could you be Hussein? I am Hussein. You know, I just came with my family. Many people actually left. And they started leaving. After Hussein alayhi salam Allah started giving them water and telling them the story, they started leaving. Oh, you are Hussein. Now oh, we thought that Hussein is this one with two horns and he's, he's so thirsty for... Huh? He thinks that uh, because his grandfather was a prophet, he must be the king. And... Because that's how those people were educated. But not the army, not all the army were Muslims. 60 or 80% of the army, they were just uh, mercenaries. mercenaries. Paid to be there. From the people of the mountains. Pagan. Hashashin. The people of the mountains still today. The people of the mountains of Lebanon and the mountains of Syria are the most dangerous people still. Ironically, they call themselves Alawis today. Subhanallah. Still. You can't feel peaceful in their presence. They are very dangerous. They were the people, the people of the mountains, of Lebanon and... The assassins, they're called in English. They call them the assassins. For generations, they were known to be the assassins. For generations, they were known to be the assassins. Even if you go to pre-Islamic history, they were the assassins during the Roman time. They were the assassins. So they're like the hitmen. Hmm? It's like a term in, in English, yeah. like hitmen. They're, they're the ones that they have no morals. They can just do, do whatever needs to be done for the king. So they were the people. So they were not like the Sunnis. Not even the Sunnis of Syria. Not even the people of Syria. The people of Syria, they were not fighters. And Muawiyah insisted that the people of Syria, they don't even know how to use weapons. They were not even allowed to carry weapons. Not since the time of Muawiyah, since the time of whom? Since the time of Roman Empire. The people of Syria, they were not the Arabs of Jahiliyyah when all, they were not free men. They were people who were accustomed to. They were subjects. The army of the Roman Empire, was it made of, out of Romans and citizens? No. It was all mercenaries. Mercenaries. Huh? Mercenaries. Same thing. The Umayyads continued with the same thing. The same system. So that's the army that Yazid sent. That's the army that was sent to Karbala. And some of them, were Mugharrar Bihim, were children of the, uh, the, the Muslims, etc. And they were, when they knew, they, they, they left. They felt shy and they left. When the, head of, the heads of the army, they saw that their army is being destabilized because of this uh, good behavior of Imam Hussein and because of this, hmm? they made a, a, wrong, a wrong attack. And they claimed that uh, 
an arrow came from the from the clan of Imam Hussein. Huh? They faked an attack and they moved and they controlled the water. And when they controlled the water, for days, Imam al Hussein was thirsty. His family, they were thirsty. And then he gave them, he showed them his baby at some point. Can you give water to this? To this baby? They sent him an arrow. And they killed the baby in the hands of his father. And these things are to be counted. And these stories are to be narrated. And we have to know that. And we have to actually mention the names of the family of the Prophet who died the day of Karbala the same way we mentioned the names of those who were martyrs the day of Badr and Uhud. We have to we have to mention all of them. Uh, and, that, and there is poetry of al Sunnah, not of Shia. Poetry. Mentioning this. Uh, mentioning the day of Arbala. ومن أليم ذكريات في الورى في يوم عاشورا بعهد غادري قتل الإمام الصبط يوم كربلاء وعصبة الآل بسيف باتر لما أتى الإمام فيه مصلحا ومستجيبا بيعة المناصر فنازلوه عنوة بجيشهم وألزموه الحرب بالخناجر فلم يسلم وأقام أهله وراءه مقاتنا بالباتر حتى رموه بالنبال وانحنى في أرض كرب وبلاء ظاهر واقتلعوا رأس الإمام ومضوا في ركضهم نحو اليزيد الخاسر وضرجوا أبناء طاها في العراب غير حق غير ظلم سافر وسشهد العباس ثم جعفر كذاك عبد الله ذو البوادر ومثله عثمان والصديق من أبناء علي المرتضى المصابر The other brothers who died of Nam Hussein Children of Ali, one of them was, huh? whose, whose name was Uthman, he died the day of Karbala. Hmm? The other one was Abu Bakr. Sayyidina Ali, he gave the name of Umar, Abu Bakr and Uthman to his children. That's why I told you, don't go back there. واذكر أبا بكر كذاك قاسم من قتلوا في حومة الحوافر كذاك أبناء الحسين السشهد وعلي وعبد الله ذو البشائر كعون نسل جعفر. سيدنا عون بن جعفر الطيار ومثله إخوة عبد الله خير سائر The brothers of Abdullah bin Ja'far All of them ومثلهم شعيد عز خالد صنوهم محمد بن الطائر وجعفر ومسلم قد قتلوا ابن عقيل الطالبي الطاهر وسشد الحب سليمان الفتى مولى الحسين الصبط بالبواتر هذا قليل من كثير قتلوا في ذلك اليوم العصيب الجائر في ذلك العهد الذي خان الولا يويحهم يوم الحساب الآخر والسأسر الآل وقادوا وقادوهم إلى أرض العراق في تحد سافر وما رعوا حق النبي المصطفى ولم يراعوا آل بيت طاهر عهد البغاة لم يزل ذكرى إذا ما ذكروا بالإفك والمجازر والحق أن الغدر في آبائنا من مبغض مقاتل وفاجر ومن داعي خذل الآل وما أبدى الدفاع في القتال الدائري صنفان في التاريخ خانوا عهدنا وسأثروا من بعد بالتناحر واشتغلوا بالنبز فيما بينهم ولم يزالوا في صراع جائر والترانزليتت إن شاء الله من التنعيد but basically he said these two kinds of people who are the true enemies of أهل البيت those who fought against them and those who promises, promised them alliance and told them you can count on us and they left them alone. So when we see someone like that today and people are leaving him, abandoning his side one after the other, don't, at least don't take it as a sign for sure that he is wrong. Because that's actually a sign that he is from Ahlul Bayt. And that's how they were. And subhanallah. Did you understand the last sentence? Can you explain it? Maybe they didn't understand it. Yeah. You did not hear it? So the two kinds, the two categories? 
And so if you see some a person today, an imam or, or a leader today, whose, whose people are not keeping loyal to him, uh, and abandoning his side one after the other, it doesn't mean, because people today, they are inclined to see, oh, huh? How come no one is following that Ah, person? there is a problem in him. Actually, if you want to think about it, that's actually a sign of his, of his legacy. Do you understand? Can you say it? Say it again. Say it again. And don't be deceived if you find somebody who doesn't have loyalty around him or doesn't have loyal followers at his side. It, it could actually be the, the sign that that person is, is in the right because it's, that's the tradition established from, from these days of these leaders that they were abandoned and they were, they were in the right. And that's the lesson that we have to take from that. Make sure you're on the right side. And make sure that you are truly there. Be careful, don't take your loyalty for granted. And that's the lesson that I want to learn from Karbala. Don't take your loyalty for granted. Don't take your loyalty for granted. May Allah protect us. May Allah protect us. Ameen, Ya Rahman, Rahman, Rabbil Alameen. And after Imam Hussain alayhi salam Allah, they kept after that killing the Imams. And they kept massacring them everywhere. And if you want to, to commemorate Karbala, commemorate the, the day of Fakh, where the children of Imam Hassan and the family of Imam Hassan were killed, all of them, except three. And after and after and after and after, and still, and some days are coming where the same history will repeat itself. The people of Ahlul Bayt at some point, they insisted to give their children the names of Jacob and Ishaq and, and yes, because the virtue of giving your children the name of, uh, of Anbiya, Tasammu bi asma al-Anbiya, but also to uh, to hide, to hide, to keep that legacy living, to be able to carry on the legacy. What legacy? The legacy of Islam, the legacy of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Don't be, uh, uh, don't belittle the power and the legacy of Ahlul Bayt. It's not just. Uh, some people, they want to laugh at us today, said, okay, the legacy of Ahl Bayt was the Fatimid Empire. And that did not have anything to do with Ahl Bayt to begin with. That had nothing, anything to do with Ahl Bayt. Anything, anything. A false claim from its, from, from its beginning. The Fatimid Empire was not a Shia Empire. But let us say it was, yes, part of it. But that's not the legacy of Ahlul Bayt. The true legacy of Ahlul Bayt is Islam uluma. Is Islam being taught still. Hmm? It's tasawwuf. The science of purification of the heart. We want to see the legacy of Ahlul Bayt, the masajid. There isn't a single masjid on earth that is not part of the legacy of Ahlul Bayt. The legacy of Ahlul Bayt, the madahab, Sunniya and Shiaiya, all of them. Any advice, any, any call to goodness and godliness on earth has to be mentioned and has to be celebrated as legacy of Ahlul Bayt. Don't belittle and don't sell them short. Because that's what they were doing. And what's that they fought for? And, what's, and that's the reason they were killed for. Insisting to leave for generations yet to come, the pure Islam and the holistic Islam. If you find the pure Islam and the holistic Islam, say Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Because it is a thanks to Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. They were the guardians. And they kept being the guardians. And they are still the guardians.
So tragedy of Karbala, was it a tragedy of Imam Hussein? Yes, emotionally speaking. What a tragedy, but subhanallah, but spiritually speaking, it is a tragedy of the humanity. It is a tragedy of the humanity, and we know that for a fact that the humanity is still the humanity. And the sickness of those who killed Imam al Hussein alayhi salam Allah is still there. And the sickness of those who gave promise to Imam al Hussein to come and protect him. Huh? And then they did not honor their promise is still there. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and you. Ameen ya arham ar-rahameen ya rabbil alameen. Ameen ya arham ar-rahameen ya rabbil alameen. There is much to learn. There is much to learn and there is much to uh, to invest in 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 our in our in our history may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a new tawfiq amin ya arhamar rahimin rabbil alamin allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina muhammad allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina muhammad allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina muhammad wa sallim taslima kathira wa rad allahumma ala ashabi rasulillah الطيبين الطاهرين يا أرحم الراحمين لا سيما الخلفاء الراشدين وتابعين لهم بإحسان اليوم الدين يا أرحم الراحمين رب العالمين يا أرحم الراحمين رب العالمين يا أرحم الراحمين رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه الطاهرين